So may I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Choice. Do you remember the last time you were chosen? I think about all those movies where you've got the sports teams being chosen and it's always the main character who's chosen last. Or maybe somebody came across you from a crowded dance hall, again, like in a film, and said, would you like to dance? Or maybe you remember your partner when they chose you. Perhaps you remember that day when they stood in front of their family, their friends and God and said, I will with this person. How does it feel to be chosen? Choice is a theme that runs throughout the scripture. To be chosen and then also to choose. To choose. You know, fairy stories always end with weddings. The fairy stories often end with anecdotes, with graduations or with jobs. Being chosen can feel like the end of the story. But those of you who've been on sports teams, those of you who've had to actually dance in front of people, those of you who've been married, will know that that being chosen is really only the beginning. And this is the tension, one of the tensions that runs throughout the entire Bible. We have those three elements that I've been going on about, that Israel indeed will be a people in a place to be a blessing. And so far, we've traced the contours of the story from Abraham to Jacob and Moses through the tragedy of Judges and then Jeff last week bringing us Samuel. And the people have asked now for a king. They've been chosen and now they're they're choosing to ask for a king. And the irony, the sadness of that is that God was to be their king. But we want to be like everyone else, they said. Everyone else around us, all the nations around They were intended to be a blessing to everybody else, but instead they wanted to be like everybody else. I wonder sometimes when church can get tempted to that too, not necessarily St. George's though, we're not immune to it, but we want to be like everyone around us. Feeling left out or feeling different can be difficult. My question is for us, not just for us St. George's, but for the whole church, is what gospel hope do we bring to the world around us if we just hold a mirror back to the world we seek to bless and to help move forward. But Israel said in their story, we want to be like everyone else. Give us a king. And so they choose Saul. And I like to think it's partly because it rhymes, but Saul was chosen partly because he was tall. He was tall, Saul. And it starts really well with Saul. I don't know if you remember the story of Saul. It starts really well. He pray, he's prayed for, he starts prophesying with people, But it quickly unravels. He's too impetuous. He's too rash. He's jealous. He's petty. He's a leader that is tall physically, but he wants to be the tallest, the big guy in the room, the alpha dog, rather than help other people grow. He makes promises he can't keep and then bottles it when the pressure is on. When it comes to his coronation, there is one of these Bible jokes. He's there hiding in the baggage in the corner. At one point, he nearly kills his own son because he made a stupid, Saul made a stupid oath that he couldn't properly keep. When it comes to conflict, he doesn't try and resolve things. He just broods until he lashes out. He sends an email or he whispers. He doesn't directly speak to someone. Insecure leaders want to control, to manipulate, make all the decisions and carry all the glory. Better leaders want to give glory away. At St George's, my heart is that there will be many leaders within this church. I'm the vicar. God has called me here for this time to be the vicar here in this place. And my prayer is that we will see new leaders grow up alongside. The church is not the vicar. Church leadership was always meant to be collaborative. Twelve disciples, remember, without one person grasping all of it. I want this to be a place where there's more than one voice. More than one leader making decisions, for God has called more. The ministry here is to be way bigger than me. And you know what? Back to our story. The new young leader has come up alongside Saul. David. Oh, David. Handsome, with beautiful eyes and ruddy complexion, says the writer. 
David, the poet who wrote so much of the Psalms, David, the warrior, Saul has killed his thousands, David has killed his tens of thousands. David, the musician, soothing the heart of the king with his harp. David, the hero. David, the pinup. Who was your hero growing up? Pop stars, sports stars. When I was a boy, I had the names of the entire Man United squad written on the back of my bookmark for school. I knew the names of all of them, including the name of the kit man, Norman Davies, and the reserve goalkeeper, third reserve goalkeeper. I had all the football shirts, including that horrible one that was grey and they blamed on their, their loss on that they never wore. Those team were my heroes. But I also knew that although I loved Man United, everybody else hated them. Now, I'm not trying to make a direct um, journey to it, but in our story today, in our passage today, David is both the hero, but he's also the outcast. He's the hero that people love, but also the man who's hunted and hated. Saul has been a disappointment and the people are ready for David, but Saul still holds the king. And so David hides, he hides in the countryside, he hides in the caves and the mountains, and he gathers an army with him, partly for protection, Partly, I'm not sure he knows why he's hiding, get, gathering them together. And Saul is hunting him out, determined to get rid of the one he knows he can feel is his successor. And you know what the story today, I mean, the Bible's so earthy. People think the Bible's going to be full of like, I don't know, angels on, on you know, high singing clouds all the time. And, and no, that's there. But it's so the Bible's so earthy. Saul goes to the loo in a cave and he's standing there. He's going, he's doing his business anyway. And this is it. This is David's chance. Just kill him. Stop living in caves. Stop living in rocks. Stop lying with the dew of the ground and the people smelly bunch of army in your rebel caves everywhere. Jerusalem beckons. Greatness beckons. He can almost taste the wine. He can feel the roar of the crowds as he enters the city on a great white horse, leading the people in leadership in front of the procession with sacrifices being made and the ark returning. Go on, say his men. Do it. Kill him. Kill Saul. No. Now, you and I might say no, but that might be because we were afraid to kill because murder is quite a big deal. David wasn't afraid to kill. He's killed many. He's slayed Goliath. That's one of his early tasks. Instead, he says this, God forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, God's anointed. Sometimes everything lines up. The stars seem to align. The moment seems there but it's not the right time. David will be king, but not just yet. And not by his own hand. He will not be made king through murder. As I had this as a young leader, not an opportunity to murder my church leader. I've had to just clear that up for the internet. I'd just been given my first ever series of sermons. Uh, we had the, it was in Taunton, a social action project called The Noise. We were on, on Halken. I was leading a team uh, as people where we were helping clear and, and clear up graffiti and litter and that kind of thing. I was preaching every morning as we went out to go and get ready. I was praying with people from when I was about 18, 17, 18, and I was flying. I was like, yeah, so I'm just, I'm, I'm there. And uh, at the end, the culmination of the week, we had this big barbecue for the whole community. And we had a charismatic leader come down, a guy called Gerald Coates. You might have heard of him. And I'm convinced he, he genuinely did have a gift of prophecy. And he's praying more publicly. And there's people around him. And he looks me dead in the eye. Boom. And he says, you are a leader, but you're not ready yet. Friends, I, I just dissolved. I was in floods of tears in front of all these kids from the estate, all my friends. I was just in floods of tears. For I knew he was right. It wasn't the right time just yet. I knew I had work to do. And David's in this situation. David will be the leader, but not yet. And not to be grasped. 
Why not? Well, for David, God's anointed one is still there. Now, let's clear it up a second, because the term anointed is one of those that's abused and thrown around all the time in the church to mean special or good. But it doesn't mean that. There are three kinds of people anointed in the scripture, prophet, priests and kings. In time, we'll see that Jesus is both prophet, priest and king. But that's another story. It was a ceremony where oil is placed on the head publicly. When I was ordained, they anointed my hands with oil. Saul has been anointed king, and it's his position given by God. The word anointed one actually is the same word for Messiah. Same one for Christ in Greek, the anointed one. And though David can almost taste the next step, it's just not yet the time for him to grab onto him. Throughout the Bible story so far, there are two choices continually made, as I said at the beginning. God's choice, that God chooses. And then within that choice, humans choose. Israel is elected, she's chosen by grace, and yet Israel is responsible for her own actions. That God's choice of Israel is not a meal ticket. It's a welcome into a garden that's ready to be worked. And this tension plays out through the entire scripture as the people are chosen but choose to say either thy will be done or my will be done. Wilson, this isn't just an ancient story. It's not just an interesting historical lesson. God's chosen you for a task. He's placed eternity in the hearts of his, uh, of his people and he is calling you. You may not be called the kingship, there may be. But he is calling you in the deep places of your soul. And you might not feel ready yet. It might not be time yet. But in this time, when you're waiting, you feel like you're fiddling around, living in a cave, and what's the point? Maybe you're frustrated. God is preparing you. God is forming you. So that the time you've got now is not wasted but it'll be used for God's glory. So that when the time comes, you'll know, and you won't need to grasp it anymore, something that you're not ready for. But instead on that day, you'll be happy and ready and willing to say, not my will be done, Lord, but thy will be done. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of uh, your word, which speaks to us so richly. Lord, for that work that you're doing in our hearts, we pray that you would move us on. Lord, we pray for those who have been chosen and called and uh, can feel that reverberating in the deepest parts of themselves. We pray, Lord, that they would know that right time to step out and give them boldness when it's time. But Lord, they wouldn't feel rushed and that you'd be using that time to prepare and to work on them. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.